Hey folks, this is Joe Cachadorian, the creator of Identity Stunt and Altered Metal at Marcosha Publishing. You can find us online at identitystunt.com or on Twitter or Instagram at, at Joe underscore K-A-C-H. And you are watching Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We're joined today by a very talented individual. He has written two comics that I've read so far, but I'm sure he has many more in the future. He is the creator of Identity Stunt and Identity Stunt 2. We're joined today by the ever-talented Joe, insert last name here. <laughs> Joe Cachadorian, and thank you for that introduction, Kurt. Hello, everybody. You know, I, I didn't want to butcher your name because I'm horrible with last names as it is, so I'm glad that you were able to say it uh, much better than I can. So the <laughs> next time you're on the show, I'll be able to say it, no problem. There we go, right on. I'll take you up on that. As long as you don't <laughs> say Kardashian, it'll be okay. Oh, no, no. I wouldn't have <laughs> you. Come on. No. But for those that don't know anything about yourself as a, as a creative person, and of course, what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking, tell us who you are and what you're all about. Sure. Thank you for that. Well, I am a uh, writer and sometimes artist based out of Austin, Texas. I've been writing for many years. I studied screenwriting in college and I dabbled in journalism in both high school and college. And I noticed that my uh, acclimations tended to be more towards script writing than, uh, you know, prose or, or novel writing. And then my passion has always lied in the visual medium of comic books. As the years went by and the chances of, you know, working for one of the bigger publishers diminished, but the chances of being an independent publisher greatly expanded due to technology and various outlets allowing for it. I decided just to make the leap into the independent publishing world, and I was fortunate enough to get picked up by the fine folks at Marcosha Publishing out of the UK, and that was the birth of Identity Stunts. The superhero genre is always a fun genre to, to be in, whether you're, you're creating your own world or your own universe, or whether you're working for, for someone else's you know, concept or idea. Completely but it seems agree. Like but you have a, a great team around you as well, too. And and I'd be remiss if I didn't ask, you know, who who is working with you on these comics? Yes, you're absolutely right. I am very blessed to have worked with such uh, an amazing number of artists. On volume one, I worked with the amazing Jay Briscoe Allison, who provided the majority of the line art. He's a great guy, and a fantastic artist. He's a graduate of the Kubert School of Art and Design, which is you know, where a lot of his amazing chops come from. But he's also got this natural talent to inject uh, life and humor the way Disney and some anime is able to do using you know, slightly larger eyes and some features slightly larger. So he brings almost an animated effect to very serious and very detailed art style. And the combination of those two things I find amazing. And I, I, I adore his art. Like he's easily in my top five favorite artists, not just to work with, but just to have the pleasure of uh, enjoying their art. Colors were provided by the amazing Juancho Velez, who has done a lot of work for a lot of independent publishers himself on volume one. And I had uh, covers for the books were done by Tone Rodriguez. Who you guys might've heard of from a number of other projects like uh, Violet Messiah, Shadowhawk, Snake Plissken, you name it. Volume two, I've been blessed again to work with uh, Ray Lay, primarily on line art, and JC Grande, who provide the art for issue one. Patrick Mock provided our covers, uh, sorry, our colors, and our covers were provided by a number of fantastic artists, including Kyler Claudfelter, Jay Briscoe Allison himself came back for issue number four in volume two. And then the amazing Joe Rubenstein provided the cover to uh, volume two, number three, using the Marvel 25th anniversary portrait that so pretty amazing to have worked with all those amazing people and you got more more coming i'm sure oh for sure for sure i got two books in the works right now outside of the identity stunt world you know looking at yourself as, as a creative writer and, and especially with a, a script writing background as well too how easy was it for you to transition from being a script writer to being a comic book writer Fairly easy. Script writing tends to have a more controlled format with how, you know, most pr production companies and, and actors and editors process the way the scripts are written, uh, certain syntax and font sizes and things of that nature. Comics are a little bit looser. And so because of that uh, flexibility, 
it was much easier to slip from film scripts and TV scripts into the comic book script world. That said, I sort of studied both at the same time. Uh, when I was in college, I studied a number of scripts by folks like Brian De Palma, Affleck and Damon's Good Will Hunting, a lot of scripts by Kevin Smith. But I was also studying scripts by uh, Ron Mars on Green Lantern and Dwayne McDuffie's work from Justice League back at the time. So um, I almost studied both together. So I wouldn't even necessarily say that I you know, went from uh, film script writing into comic script writing. I, I did both at the same time. As a writer, then, what is the hardest part, especially with identity stunt, the beginning, the middle, or the end? Oof. You know, I think it would depend on the day you ask me on which <laughs> part I'm working on, but I want to say the middle. You know, you always want to stick the landing, and that is not easy to do. Don't get me wrong. But I think where you tend to lose your readers the most is if that middle ground is not solid and continuously moving things forward in both an engaging way and a way that keeps the story progressing, as opposed to I've got to fill in the gaps between this cool opening I came up with and this cool ending I came up with. <laughs> if only some films would uh, take your advice, you know? Yes, I agree. I agree. I just... Too much padding going on in a lot of uh, the big budget films these days. Well, they're still making millions and, and we're doing what we're doing. So. And I go watch them multiple times. <laughs> <Exactly. I know. laughs> yeah, looking at your scripts and how they came together then, especially when you gave them to your, your very talented artists as well, too. What was the scene that you wrote when your artist was, was finished with it? that you were like, wow, this turned out way better than I expected. Or maybe it, it was a new vision that you maybe didn't foresee. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. That was almost the case across the board, uh, especially in volume one. Uh, just seeing what uh, John J. Briscoe, what he was able to do with, with my scripts was mind blowing. I would always uh, joke with him that it was like, you know, seeing a baby born where you didn't really know what the baby looked like. And then, you know, when it comes out, you're like, oh my God, it's so beautiful. It's the mix of, you know, the vision in my head and the vision in his head. And that, you know, can be said from a lot of artist uh, writer relationships. I would say issue four, volume one, really towards the tail end. Uh, I, I don't want to give away any spoilers, but when a, a certain character saves the day at the end of volume one, that one panel came out better than I would have ever imagined. And just the power that came through and the emotion that came through on both the, both of the characters involved in that scene, it really got to me for a second. It was, it was breathtaking uh, for a moment. I think when people get to that scene, if they haven't read the, the book already, they'll know what I'm talking about. Uh, there are also some more tender moments in the epilogue sequence, what I called the post credits in volume one. I wasn't expecting the touching moments that I wrote to come off as quite as touching once drawn. And that was a very pleasant surprise as well. So then in, in your opinion, you know, what's the most important quality of a comic writer or a writer in general in today's creativity? And how does that translate to what you've done with identity set? Oof, that's a great question. I feel like there's, answers on the multiple layers. From a creative perspective, if you're solely looking at the writing, you have to finish it. I cannot think of a better piece of advice to give anybody trying to break into any form of writing. You have to finish something, whether it's a short story, a script for a one shot, a script for a miniseries, graphic novel, movie, whatever it is, a novel, just finish it and get it done. After that, I think the second most important piece is coming up with a schedule that you can realistically stick to because a big piece of finishing something is having the momentum there to carry you through to get it done and to keep the excitement going internally, where if you sort of keep stepping back from things, it's possible to reignite that flame and then keep building things at a slower pace. But I've found it in my perspective to not be quite as effective. When it comes to comic book writing, and this is something not a lot of people talk about, especially in the indie world, is project man management skills are almost just as important as your creative skills. You have to know how to not only uh, you know, work with people and accommodate other people's views on how things work, but also make sure that, that they can uh, stick to the schedule that you've created to make sure your book you know, hits on time and, and uh, your, your deadlines are met, whether they're Kickstarter or for the publisher or whatever it may be. 
that's really important. And I don't think a lot of indie creators go into it with their eyes open in that perspective. Even in life in general, it's difficult yes. to, to manage things. Yeah. Folks, if you've got like a LinkedIn learning account or something, take a entry project management class. It's going to do you wonders in life. What is your favorite underappreciated film or comic book that people should be looking at or reading? Oof. Underappreciated comic book or film. I'm looking around here. <laughs> you know what I just read from Image that uh, I really enjoyed was Ultra Mega. Uh, it's a take on the whole Ultraman, you know, uh, uh, mythology of uh, the human being imbued with alien powers to fight other aliens and they grow really large and they have battles of kaiju. He had a really interesting take on on that genre uh the creators of that book and i, I think uh, that really stuck out to me i think it was james heron was a creator on that from a movie perspective what did i you know what i saw the other day that i thought was much better than uh, people gave it credit for was death on the nile the recent oh. agatha christie adaptation um by kenneth Branagh and michael green wrote the script on that I really enjoyed the film. My wife's a huge fan of Agatha Christie. We watched in the previous Murder on the Orient Express. Film didn't have a lot of fanfare around it. I know there were some, you know, elements of concern due to some behaviors of the actors involved. But uh, it was a really solid film with a lot of surprises, even if you hadn't read the script. There are some characters added into the story that weren't from the book that also added to some of the added mystery. And it was really well done. I think if people gave that movie a shot, they'd really like it. It's on Hulu right now. What's the most misunderstood aspect about being a writer? That it's easy. It is not easy. <laughs> the, the process of being creative can be so challenging, paralyzing, and anxiety-inducing. It's, it's kind of hard to put into words, even if, if you're a writer. Art is also incredibly challenging and takes a lot of patience. And man, my hat's off to, to a lot of artists who are able to, to create pages on, on a regular basis that just looks so amazing because that is an inherent skill that, that does not come very often. Now, writing, I don't necessarily think has as much of that necessary level of grueling that a lot of the regular comic book artists have to go through. It's like when you're told, hey, make a joke, comedian, be funny, you know, <laughs> on the fly. It's not easy to do. You know, if I sat down at a keyboard and I'm like, okay, I need to write something right now. That's not really where my creative drive or inspiration is coming from. My creativity is really coming when I'm doing other things. You know, I'm walking around, I'm talking to people, playing with my kids, doing the dishes. That's really when ideas pop into my head. Uh, when I'm sitting at the, the computer, that's when I'm trying to get that stuff onto the page. But coming up with the, the things that work that have not been done before is very challenging and it takes a certain skill itself. So then what is your creative kryptonite? Oof. Creative kryptonite is distraction. I remember my friend uh, Daniel Calvin was on the show a few weeks ago and he had mentioned procrastination. <laughs> and I would say along with, you know, it's very similar to that. And that would be distractions. I am fairly easily distracted. I, I am a collector of many things, as you can say, as you can see, while also being a creative, you know, there's always something else you, you could be doing. So that's why it's also important going back to those project management skills I referred to earlier to create a schedule that you stick to, because by sticking to that schedule, you're not going to have those distractions really come up. You're going to tell yourself between this hour and this hour, I'm only writing, I'm doing nothing else but writing. That's going to make uh, things a lot easier and help you be the Superman to overcome that kryptonite. And there's a lot of apps out there too to help. Focus Keeper is the, the main one. What I like about that, believe it or not, it's more the sound of a ticking clock. So I can hear it the whole time. So if I hear that clock ticking, I feel like I'm being watched by the app, so to speak. <laughs> and I got to make sure that I get through this 25 minute uh, piece of uh, project work. And then it gives you a five minute break. And then another 12, 25 minutes of work, five minute break. And that five minute break allows you to jump into those little distractions that have been kind of niggling away at you. And then the ticking clock reminds you it's time to get back to work. And I've found that very, very useful at my ripe age of 42 years old here. Do you think someone could be a writer if they don't feel emotions? Yes, I do. I think anybody can be a writer if they take the time to write and just get stuff done. There's a lot of types of writing out there that don't necessarily require emotion, so to speak. I know a number of folks who are technical writers, for example, where they write uh, product manuals or quick start guides for various technology. 
does creative writing and fictional writing require emotion? To a degree. I do think it, it does. But writing in general, not necessarily. But you really do want to make your reader feel something if they're reading one of your stories. So in that regard, you have to be able to inject emotion into your creative writing, uh, if not possessing it at least. So then how many half-finished scripts do you have? Oh, man, so many. Uh, I've got half-finished 11-page scripts, meaning like five are done. I have half-finished graphic novel scripts, which means 50 of 100 are done. I've got half-finished six-page scripts, which means three of six are done. Uh, but what's important there, I tell myself, I don't necessarily look at those as failures. Uh, that was just a road I took, and I realized I'd be better off going back and taking a different road, and maybe someday I'll come back to this road. I think it's more important to give something a shot, and if you feel like it's not going the way you want, then to step away and try something new than not to try uh, at all. What makes you excited about writing Identity Stunt? Just seeing the, the characters go through these chapters of their lives that myself and others are sort of creating for them. You know, as human beings, I think we crave control in our lives that we don't really have. Uh, whereas in writing, especially, you know, uh, consecutive but creative writing, you're able to craft lives and control the lives of, you know, people and beings and things of that nature that you don't really get that satisfaction in life. And there's an element of joy that comes with, you know, putting people through challenges that they're then able to overcome and, and the benefits that come with that and the lessons learned that come with that. The other thing I really love is the reaction from my readers who, who like what they're reading. And even those that aren't necessarily in love with what they read, I always appreciate that, that feedback. Um, but, you know, whenever I, I tweet something out about a new issue being available and, you know, you hear people's comments about it or retweeting and resharing it, it's always really nice to know that I've, you know, I've put work into something that means a lot to me that is also bringing some element of fun or joy or excitement to somebody else's day who, you know, maybe they're having a good day, maybe they're not having a good day. And, you know, whatever it is I've written has given them some element of happiness that wasn't there otherwise. And that, that's really something that keeps me going. What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? You know, I think as a kid, sometimes you'll learn that what you say impacts people more than you expect it to, you know, whether positively or negatively. And that's what helps build your your social cues and, and your social etiquette. From a writing perspective, I wrote an article once many years ago, somewhat on the political side of things, but, but not too heavily. And, and I wasn't trying to be heavy handed. I don't think I was. And I honestly, till this day, it was a guest column I wrote for somebody. I have no idea how many people read it or, or whatnot, but somebody sent me a note and said what I wrote had caused her to rethink how she was approaching certain things she was doing and was going to have a, a conversation with her family about it later that night. That sort of blew my mind. I mean, that was the only comment I got really from, from that whole thing. Uh, but just that one person saying that not only did what I wrote impact them, but they were going to sit down and talk about it with their family. You know, she wasn't saying I'm 100% right. And I, I you know, changed her life or anything like that. But the fact that I, she took a moment to reconsider something and was willing to discuss it further was you know, really important to me to try to inject some of that into my creative and, and fictional writing as well. And if you can present somebody with a lesson that, that changes how they're approaching life for the betterment of themselves and humanity, that's really the best you know, gift we can, we can give people. Do you think the art of conversation is lost in today's technology? I think our technology has made it easier to be lazy. <laughs> it's all in how you use it. People used to write very long letters when they could only send two or three letters a year to a family member, you know, via, via boat or something like that. And now with text messages, you know, you can write in W instead of with and W O without and, and whatnot. But at the same time, I think by decreasing the time it takes to communicate with people, there is an added benefit to that. And I, I just wish that people would 
take these changes in technology that are ultimately designed to make things better and use them for that as opposed to using them as, as ways to have shortcuts. But you look at Twitter, you know, I know I have conversations with my friends who talk about Twitter and, oh, some of them hate it, some of them love it. And I say it's all in how you use it. You know, you can use Twitter very, very eloquently and you can get a lot of people to read what you have to perhaps change how they're doing things or have a new perspective. Or you can use Twitter in a very negative fashion, in a destructive and toxic fashion. It's your choice. And, and that's sort of how I see things when it comes to communication. People are really the ones who need to make that decision, not, not the technology itself. Do you believe in writer's block? Not, not have you had writer's block, but do you believe in it? Yes. I, it depends on how you view writer's block, Kurt. Am I writing, let's say I've got a script in front of me and I've got a, I'm at a page where I need to come up with a line of dialogue that really hits. It's a poignant scene. And I, yeah, I may sit there for hours turning on it and, you know, going into uh, analysis paralysis and, and just not being able to move forward because I really got to get that one line right. The other perspective though, is I could potentially not worry about that line and just move on to the next section of the, of the script I'm working on or the, another project that I'm working on and whatever, whatever creative energy I have there will start flowing into that in that direction, as opposed to the one where, where the wall came up. So that, that's kind of how I see it. It's almost like a, a river, not a road. If somebody throws a giant rock in the middle of a river, the water tends to flow around it uh, and keep going. It might go in different directions, but it keeps going. Whereas in a road, you throw a giant rock there, the road breaks, cars can't really you know, keep going and it causes a big interruption. I think creativity allows you to go in different directions. So yes, I believe you can run into creative deadlocks and writing deadlocks on certain things. But overall, I feel as creatives, we have so many ideas bubbling around in our heads that if I'm saying I need to get some writing done, this one issue is holding me back, I'm just going to jump into something else. You know, I, I find world building and, and nameology fascinating with creative people because it really kind of shines a light on their their psyche in in a certain extent not not i'm not going to go freud on you just yet that's for, the, <laughs> that's for the second half but fair enough when it comes to then the world that you've built with identity stunt but when it comes to building the world that you have created so far and that you will continue to create for however long you, you do this, you know, what themes did you build into the world that really spoke to you as a writer? That's a really good question too, man. The story was initially approached as a Western that was influenced by the progression of how a video game works, right? So, you know, each level you beat a boss, you move on to the next level and it's a little bit harder and then the next level. And that's how I approached volume one. So I tried to keep things like late 70s cartoon, Blue Falcon and Dino Mutt kind of approach where you kind of live in this world where you accept there's a little bit of zaniness. It's called Studio City, um, but there's still enough there where it's a real world. That's kind of how I tried to keep it. Where it's obviously not that realistic, you kind of have to take that with a grain of salt as, as you go in. I mean, I'm heavily influenced by animation, both uh, 70s and 80s cartoons, mm -hmm. uh, 90s cartoons as well. And that is how I structure a lot of my stories in my head. So then the nameology aspect of the question, <laughs> you know, how did you come up with the names of, of some of your characters? I guess it would depend on their, the real names or, or the code names. The real names were, my lead character's name is Sammy Nasser. I really wanted a character who was an Arab American to be reflected as a lead in a, in a comic book. And that was what drove me to run with Sammy. And I also wanted to give him a name that could be adapted into, you know, a, a more Americanized and Western take. So that's why a lot of his friends call him Sam and his family calls him Sammy, though I'm actually now in, in today's world making a concerted effort to stick more with, with Sammy. The names of a lot of the side characters, if all of you out there are paying attention, they are pieced together by character names from other 80s and 90s action films. So Jolene Armstrong is a play off of Joe Armstrong, the lead character, uh, American Ninja. Tracy Hicks Nasser is a play off of Dante Hicks from Clerks. 
Detective Shatter is actually a character played by Chuck Norris in one of his films, which is why he looks like Chuck Norris. So that's where a lot of that came from. The code names, I wanted to be as ridiculous as possible. A vigilante named Beatdown, like, come on. Uh, and that was what I wanted. I wanted something as ridiculous as punch you in the face, man. And uh, Beatdown's what I came up with. You know, the primary antagonist in volume two's name is Dr. Father. Like, I just wanted something over the top and, and ridiculous there, too. Um, and that's really, again, think of that video game analogy I used earlier. Uh, I, I'm looking for over the top villains, you know, Crash Cummings and Pummel Dean and Jackknife Julie. These aren't meant to be subtle. What's one thing you wish to accomplish before you die? You know, it used to be I want to get a graphic novel published. Like, you know, if there's one thing I want to make sure uh, I've done on my deathbed, you know, you follow all the checkbox approach to life, the, the good job, the family and, and all that. And I'm very happy and, and, and blessed to have achieved all those things. But from a personal endeavor, it was always getting that first graphic novel done. But now I've done that. So what's that next thing? I would love to write something related to the Transformers franchise, wherever and whatever that may look like. In fact, the next project that I'm working on uh, for Marcosia is heavily influenced by that, that mecha genre, but it is not Transformers itself. And for me, that would be a crowning achievement is to, to do that, even if it's outside of comics. So if it's like a children's book for their little, you know, bot characters, an episode of a TV show on, on their YouTube channel, whatever it may be, that's something I would love to, to do before I die. What's the second wisest thing someone has ever said to you that has stuck with you in your career? Hmm. Sean McKeever once told me that if there's something you really want to write, a character you really want to write, just write it and don't call it that character. I've held on to that advice for a long time, and it has definitely been helpful when it comes to, to some of my writing and character creation and story direction is having that thing that I really want to write in my head and just slightly altering it for, for public consumption. I think if a lot of folks approach their writing that way, they would dive into it more. The other second piece of advice I would say also is the, the two-minute clock. Uh, you, you asked earlier about writer's block. And one way to really overcome you know, analysis paralysis is to say, I'm going to work on this for two minutes. And then if I don't like what I'm doing, I'll, I'll shift to something else. And you'll find at least 80% of the time, two minutes will blow by and you will keep on keeping on to whatever that task was, as long as you actually stick with it for that first two minutes. And uh, that's another piece of uh, wise advice that I received at a secondary perspective. What's one mistake that you'll never do again? Concede my vision. Okay. If you feel strongly in something, don't water it down or go in a direction you're not 100% comfortable with due to a feeling of, you know, codependency, or I need to do this in order to keep people happy. If you compromise things early, you'll never really get them back the way you wanted. And that's something people I think should keep in mind. That was a lesson I learned for sure. Something you could pay more attention to in life. Other people's daily challenges. You know, I feel sometimes I get wrapped up into my own stuff. And I forget that other people have stuff going on too. It's important to always take a kinder, gentler approach to any type of conversation, regardless of how you're feeling or how your day has gone or how much stress you have in your life or how far behind you are in a script that other people have their crap that they're you know, slugging through as well. Harmony comes from A, not offending or hurting somebody going through something, but then also the feeling that you give yourself of knowing that you are better in how you approach things is a blessing in and of itself. And that's something I want to try to do more of. Before I do that, is there anything I haven't touched on you'd like to showcase those are watching and listening to this interview? We'll talk about social media where we can find you at the end of the show itself. So I'm getting some figurines made of a lot of our identity stunt leads. This is uh, the Sammy Nasser with his volume two look over here. Yeah. Jolene, the aforementioned Jolene Armstrong right here. 
Beat down from volume one is also going to be making an appearance. And That's then we've right. got a few other characters in development as well. And those are my prototypes. And as an avid action figure collector myself, I'm super excited to see those brought to life. Are you making this into a D&D campaign? Because that's what it sounds like. <laughs> you know, I I should. I love the game. I, I love the role-playing aspect of D&D and how it's sort of been, uh, that approach has been appropriated by a lot of other genres and a lot of other um, brands. And they've utilized that approach. And I think it works really well. Um, and yeah, hey, someday if I can have like a D&D type uh, role-playing strategy game for identity stunt, where you got to make your way through Studio City and overcome all your, your challenges, be over the top villains. Absolutely. Though I'll tell you what, I think my next project uh, would be more in line with that type of gaming approach. Well, I mean, dun dun dun. You know, <laughs> I guess I, I can talk about it. I mean, uh, it's sure. it's called Altered Metal. It is, like I said earlier, it is a play on the uh, mech genre and the Transformers and GoBots and, and all that good stuff and Gundam. Uh, and it's about a, a group of soldiers who are embroiled in a civil war who have found out some information about an artifact that may end this war and they go on a mission to uh, basically a heist to get this artifact bring an end to the war but i think as they learn and as everybody knows going through the story that you know finding an artifact is not all it takes to end decades and decades worth of, of war. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? Well, I don't want to offend anybody in my family because obviously I'd like to say, you know, my parents and then my wife, because they were, certainly were uh, an inspiration to do what I want to do in life and do what makes me happy. But from a writing perspective and, and the, the script writing and creative aspect, and I, I hate to be the cliche here, but really Kevin Smith, <laughs> that, that guy has popped up so many times throughout my life over the past 20 to 30 years, um, you know, from first meeting him at Comic-Con in the late 90s to being on his podcast a few years ago, to actually listening to an episode of his podcast that made me go home later that day and start writing Identity Stunt. So draw a direct line of inspiration it would be to, to kevin smith and the message he drives about really creating something that's yours and doing something with it from a professional perspective you you've created multiple issues of identity stunt you are creating obviously more that you just spoke of when it comes to your creative process that way so professionally you are successful do you consider yourself personally successful I do. I see myself personally successful. I have achieved a lot of the goals I've set out for myself. And I do feel that I am, I'm fortunate. You know, I'm not the most religious of, of people, but I, I do feel blessed on top of being successful because I've also been very lucky in life. Uh, outside of my hard work and dedication, I've also had fortune and I don't ever want to lose sight of that. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? You need, you need failures. The worst kind of failure is giving up. Uh, if you get knocked down, but then get back up again, that's not, that's not failure. You know, if, if the rug gets pulled out from under you, you, you hit a wall, a roadblock, um, as long as you keep going and overcoming that failure, you learn from it. And, and you need failure to learn important lessons in life, in, in, in writing and in creativity and in, in, in relationships, whatever it may be, you have to know what that breaking point is a lot of the time in order for you to avoid it. Um, and then you think about exercising too. Um, you know, when you work out, if you pump iron every day, let's say, you know, you're a weightlifter. I don't know if people still use the term pump iron. I'm a child of the 80s. At some point, no matter how strong you are, how good of a weightlifter you are, your arms are going to give out, right? That is your, your point of failure. But if the day before you put up 13 reps till you hit your point of failure, and today you put up 15 reps till you hit your point of failure, yesterday's point of failure gave you an avenue of growth for two more reps for today. 
And now your muscles are that much stronger. And that's sort of how I see failure as well in other aspects is it's your muscles hitting a point where they need to rest now in order for you to be even stronger at your next attempt. But as long as you don't give up, they are lessons and not failures. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as a comic writer or a writer in general, or maybe it's something else creatively different than what you're currently doing. And the fact that you have the younger generation with you, you know, they're going to be creative in some way, shape or form. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? To create, you know, to create something that is maybe new and different than what is inspiring people now. And that's, what's going to inspire people going forward. You know, a lot of kids now they're watching YouTube videos and, and YouTubers instead of cartoons or TV personalities. And those are then um, sparking creativity for these kids to start creating their own varieties of, of videos, whether they're on YouTube or TikTok or, or what have you. Um, and then even in the arts, I grew up on the traditionals, you know, Jim Lee, Todd McFarlane, preceding that, George Perez, and then from an artistic perspective. And that's really what fueled my fire from, from an artist's view. But my kids, for example, they're into the, you know, the Dave Pilkey approach to, to graphic novels, you know, Dogman and Captain Underpants. And there's that new uh, series called The Bad Guys, where there's an animated film coming out of that as well. And those are, in essence, graphic novels, just not the ones that you and I grew up on. And that's really what I see. My kids are, are creating their graphic novels and comic books around that type of approach. And I think if they were only given the comics that I grew up on, or even the stuff that's come a little bit after that, that may not have resonated with them, but something, you know, kind of out of left field, like Captain Underpants or, or Dogman, which are not only you know, very interesting and, and, and very on the nose names that have really caught on approach to art that is absolutely unconventional. And I think that in and of itself is what has inspired a lot of people too that unconventionality. And I think that's really what I want to see happens. Things have to evolve and change in order to stay fresh. And I think stuff like Dogman being successful in bookstores makes books like Batman and Spider-Man more successful in bookstores too. Well, I do hate to say this, Joe, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You've survived, so thank you so much. I greatly appreciate it. Well, thank um, you for your thoughtful questions. I appreciate that. Uh, I try, and thank you for, for your wonderful answers to said questions. Before I let you go, where can we find you? How can we support you and everything along that line from social media and on? All right. Well, you can find all things Identity Stunt related at identitystunt.com. It is going to redirect you to another site, don't, uh, to a Tumblr site. Don't worry about it. That's by design for now. I'm trying to keep my website simple and just you know, deliver information in a blog format. You can find me on social media as at Joe underscore K-A-C-H, Joe Catch. That was my nickname in uh, school. That's what I go by on social media on both Instagram and Twitter. And you can find us on Facebook for Identity Stunt at just uh, facebook.com slash well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You, you can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com and twogeekstalking.com. That's the word, two, not the number two. And, of course, on our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash tgtmedia. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening watching on Two Geeks Talking.